I'll use Grok to see if I can find it and then put it put it up in here. That's that's number one. And number two, I've been a little inactive for three days because I was with the Spaced Out Radio fan party in Nevada. And we had Melinda Leslie, Laurie and Fenton, and a bunch of other people there, the usual kind of attendees, and we all went out in the desert and got in a communal circle, did our meditation, and asked them to visit. And we had 24 craft come in an, to, to an hour and a half. Damn. It was, it was wild. Did you guys get any video of that? You got to be kidding. Not one damn person brought a camera. Of the, what? And, uh, <laughs> not one person. Not even me. And I've got not a phone. Of the camera. You didn't have a phone. Yeah, yeah. But, but I'm telling you, the way the craft were coming, you didn't have time to grab your phone up and point it. So it was, uh, it was not like meteors, but it was, it was quick. Yeah, it's Except like the thought it's... reaction CE5 stuff, that it's not like this slow-moving thing where you're like, oh, let me get it, my camera out. It's like, all right, show yourself. Oh, except, and like, on the corner one. of your eye, there's like this thing yeah, that goes Except for one, eye. Astral. One. One, we should have gotten. There is no excuse. We were just going, oh, they decided to come, and nobody thought about it. It's one of those kind of experiences. So great big orb, like 40-foot orb orb had an amber light on it and it had no nav lights no flashers nothing on it and it flew all the way across the sky so we knew it was not an airplane had no nav lights and then faded out right in front of us and not one of us took a video of it i mean just that's that crap happens what's going on with these orbs is the solar storm by the way bob um i've been seeing a lot of things floating around up there that aren't very traditionally what i usually see like you see those little satellites run around but these ones are weird you think it's like plasma from the storm or what i i, th I think uh, I, even i saw what i thought were wisps of aurora in the nevada desert because it was dark uh and but i i so you could be seeing little blobs of ionization happening in the oxygen so the oxygen purple is pink or purple is really high, and the green is oxygen lower in the atmosphere. So uh, you can see that stuff in these aurora. But I, all I got was hints. But I, I'm, I'm urging. I didn't get aurora, aurora where I was very much. It was just these little lights flying, you know, zooming around. But it's okay. I, I'm still on the hunt for what they could have been. But thank you, Bob. Yeah, keep looking. Uh, you're awesome, by the way. I always like it when you're in spaces. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Anyway, uh, uh, yep. Uh, J Jimbo. Yeah, we'll go to Jimbo, then Paul. So my uh, boy, Holiday Jesus, Paul. shows up too. Oh, Paul? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Oh, okay. Uh, are you sure, Jimbo? I, th I think he was first. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, so th thanks for letting me back up. I, I know I was coming in a bit hot, but I just want to say a few things. So first of all, the Marion apparition that Screen mentioned. Uh, there, there's a, a top researcher on that case uh, by the name of Francisco Morao Correa, and he makes it very clear that uh, people weren't seeing the Marian apparition during the majority of that event. The Marian apparition itself came from those three kids uh, who, you know, are much less... Um, let's say, credible on their own, just being three kids, as opposed to the however many thousands of people it was that saw the miracle of the sun at a, at a different time. Um, so I, I think you're conflating stuff a little bit there, but I, I do see your point. Um, so just wanted to correct that, and I agree that, you know, it could be ionization of the atmosphere, things like this. We just don't know because it was a hundred freaking years ago, and, and there's no way we're ever going to learn the truth about that. Anyway, moving on from that, um, I think that there's a something that constantly gets lost when I try to argue in favor of the genuine anomalous nature of experiences that people have is that I am not I am not like what you'd call a true believer. I am not as ascribing any hypothesis or narrative to this. I'm not saying that I've been abducted or visited by aliens or whatever. I'm saying that I've had these experiences. Uh, on one or two occasions, I've had physical results, but as Screen said, just because I might have, you know, seen a gray alien or whatever and then had some physical uh, effects from that doesn't mean I was abducted by aliens. And I have 
always kept that stance. You will never catch me saying, you know, straight up, I've been abducted by aliens. People will say that about me, but that, that is not how I feel. What I do feel is that I've had genuine experiences that I'm not lying about that, which, which defy explanation. And I think if I'm not mistaken, third, you are writing off and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you're writing off all of these experiences as either military technology, people lying, or people being mistaken. And with, so with that said, before you respond, um, I, uh, I agree that much, maybe even most of it, can be explained by those things, in addition to sleep disorders and, and, and things like that. But I do think that there is a percentage, perhaps a very small percentage, of experiences that people have, whether they are um, more consciousness-based, in altered states, which I, I don't think altered states means bullshit, by the way, or whether they are, uh, you know, UFO sightings, uh, quote, abductions, etc. I, I believe that these anomalous things do happen. I don't know what they are, but I believe they do happen. So I'm just going to, I'm going to close by asking you, Ferd, do you think that every single one of these can be attributed to the to the uh, causes that I just mentioned, and if so, I think that that is intellectually dishonest to say. Like Screen said, it is a gray area. We are still learning about this, and to claim that you know the absolute truth, I do think, is insulting to people who have had these genuine anomalous experiences. You might not uh, be intending it to be insulting, but you know, people can easily take it that way. Thank you well, for, for the time. You took it as, you took it as insulting, like really quickly, but um, I did. I was defensive. I apologize for that. But, um, uh, so I'm 40 years old. I've been here 40 years. Um, so you can say I have, I've had 30 years of like, uh, intelligent thought. And I'm 33 for the record. So you're seven years older. Okay. Um, I've had two experiences in my life that I can't explain Two, Um, and they're both really, really fucking weird. And so I know that shit happens. Um, but, n um, I also was struck in with fucking sleep paralysis at a very young age. Like I had it nearly every day from a young child until like eight years old. And I also understand that that will fuck up your head like horribly. And it's very real. And that's why I talk about that. Bec so, um, yeah, I know there's things that we don't understand about our consciousness. Uh, of course. We're living in flatland, in a, in a reality we can't understand. But, also, the dreams are very real. That's all I'm saying. They're so real. So, do you think there's anything, anything truly anomalous? That's all I'm asking. Or do you think it's all essentially mistakes, lies, and military tech? Uh, well, I, I think everything that we've seen as far as uh, spacecraft is is probably everything we videoed. Yeah, that's probably military stuff. I do. And you're a little more open. Okay, that's fair enough. But you're maybe a little more open to the other stuff, or, or you also think that it's sleep disorders. In other words, you don't you don't leave any. Do, do you leave any room open for other possibilities? Dude, I, my my ex girlfriend, we we talk in our sleep. Like still to this day, it's been like ten years. We still talk in our sleep. Like it's totally real. Um, and that's faster than the speed of light that defies physics. Like I, I understand that things exist that we don't understand. Um, I, for, 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 I just want to add, this is a much better interaction and your, than your first, what I thought was knee jerk response. This is a good conversation. And one more thing, uh, Astral, we have multiple requesters and not enough hosts to bring them up. Okay.
I can host, but there's already a two. Are you allowed to have more? I wish. No. Uh, no. Somebody's not speaking. If they wouldn't mind dropping down. Otherwise, if we drop you, please don't take it personal. It's just a, you know, contribution wise. Drop me down once I make my. Uh, so I had a sleep paralysis incident and I was comforted <clears throat> calling it a sleep paralysis. And I understand where this guy's coming from because it, if, if what I had was a sleep paralysis, it was a reality. It was, and I knew all about how sleep paralysis worked. I always was a little astounded that we're wired that way. It doesn't seem to uh, answer its own questions. You know, it kind of opens up questions to me. But having that happen was a comfort. So um, it, it, it allowed me to have my belief systems stay in check and, and to feel safe at night, you know. Um, I don't... I no longer believe it. Um, the shared experience thing is a key. It should never happen. I'm, I'm agreeing with what Kurt Curtis had said. Is, is uh, someone's always lying, right? So, but it does happen. I have very close to me just had a shared death experience the father died laying in bed next to him he didn't know he was dying he had the death experience so psychologically there's one way might happen that's what happened you're cutting out real bad and buddy. the science Oh, it always happens. Yeah. I caught the gist of that. Sorry, I just wanted to say I was also comforted by, by that same mechanism when I had my experiences. I said they were all sleep paralysis, and it took me years for me to change my opinion. Sorry. Yeah. No, those shared experiences are actually crazy. People need to. You're cutting out bad, Jimbo. You're rubber banding. All good, though. Uh, we, we got a lot of what you were saying, though. Definitely. Thanks, man. Uh, screen and then over to Sarah and then MC squared. All right. Um, hope, hopefully y'all can uh, hear me. I just had to hop in the car real quick. Um, it's really tough to get spaces to connect uh, through my Bluetooth in the car for some reason. But uh, this it gets this conversation. Uh, it gets hard. Um, and I always say like an um too much. I can walk a ranch. But, this is why I'm working on this uh, documentary because to have this conversation, it goes in so many different directions and then you have to explain certain things so that way people can understand what's going on and most people just don't know basic science and that's not like an insult, right? Like uh, th there's a lot of stuff that we just kind of like memorized in school and we didn't really learn it, right? Um, so it, it gets... Like, a lot of this stuff is just science. Uh, actually, most of it is, right? Science and physics. Um, that's why I always talk about people learning alchemy and uh, the occult, because that was kind of like science and physics before. It was called science and physics. And they, they talk about all the same stuff that we're talking about. They just call it by different things. Uh, gin, fairy, etc., right? But it's always around light. That's why my argument is that UFO videos will never be anything other than lights, shadows, or something that's blurry, a combination of both. And it's kind of like what Plato was talking about, uh, but to speed it up and kind of get the science in there at the same time, uh, just imagine that we live in, uh, in, in a light matrix. And when we talk about consciousness and, you know, kind of dreaming the sleep paralysis stuff or whatever, altered states, uh, we kind of dream reality as well. We just don't see it that way. Um, so there are things like orbs, which give off uh, electromagnetic waves uh, that affect our brain and how we perceive reality. And that, that can explain the shared experiences. 
as well as we always talk about sympathetic resonance. Uh, you know, when you're around somebody long enough, like if you work with them or live with them or family, uh, you're in sync. You're thinking the same things at the same time. Uh, so, like, that's why genetics is such an important thing because it's it's like a copy. <laughs> so you're closer to that sympathetic resonance. It's easier, right? That explains the twins, yeah. all of that. I think it's love. I think it's love that matters. It's not family. Yeah, well, love could be argued to be consciousness as well, all the same energy in just different forms. But the point I'm getting at is uh, orbs are just science as well. Uh, the sun would affect us all the same, right? And like I said, we live in a light matrix. So essentially we are seeing glitches in the matrix. Uh, we see the sun every day to us. Uh, but if it was regular for orbs to come floating by, then you would just be cool with that, and then it would make sense, which it happens where I live at. Uh, it's an old thing. It, it was like a rite of passage that you'd go out to the spot, and the orb would chase you, and uh, we were teenagers. So it's like, you know, that area was named by the Lakota tribe, or uh, I'm sorry, the Edisto tribe, and uh, so they knew about all this stuff, right? The Lakota tribe, they, uh, who was a black elk, he talks about these altered states and these uh, beings that are from dream time, and the cloud people and all that. Uh, they're just describing high frequency of energy and plasma in different ways. Uh, you know, it's like now we, we explain it in different ways, but 99.9% uh, .9 of the answers are out there. People just don't want to hear the real answers or, or put in the time to look for it. It's like the thought, like disclosures already happened. You just have to research it to find it. Go ahead, Sarah. Hey, um, I wanted to let screen know, you know a lot about plasma stuff, so I DM'd you. Uh, so if you check your DMs, I had a question for you. That's pretty much it. But I, I love this conversation. I think uh, I think we have a lot of uh, people across the spectrum here in terms of what they've experienced and, you know, what their explanations could be, and it's kind of all up in the air. But I wanted to do a huge shout out to Carl Nell for fucking stepping up, Salt Conference, baby. He's I saw the, did you see the new title for, the for his talk? Have you seen the new title for his talk? They just announced yeah, it. Yeah, it's so fucking cool. Sick. I missed it. What is it? Oh, I had it pulled up. Uh, it's like the Black Swan event. It says. UFO disclosure, control disclosure, and non-human intelligence. Yeah, the real Black Swan event. The control disclosure of UAP and non-human intelligence. Yeah, so That's just so cool. I, I just want people to know, it, uh, everybody from John Ramirez to four other people that I know have got, uh, uh, t on in touch with the inside is that Carl Nell was the guy kind of everyone picked to lead controlled disclosure. So uh, it's, it's, it, it, controlled disclosure was real. They just didn't yes. pull it off. That's exactly right. No, yeah. they totally pulled it off, dude. They're pulling it off every day. Oh, I think the UAP Disclosure Act was their was their major shot, and it didn't pass. Real quick, uh, one thing I did forget about Paul and uh, what you said about Fatima. Um, yeah, there was also a third event, which is uh, like what I was talking about. Uh, Greg Little has a post on it that I'll try to share when I can, real quick. Um, but basically. This, some guy wrote a paper on it. Uh, these earthquakes in the area were uh, causing the, the the crystal in either the granite or the marble that the church was made out of. I forget which one. Uh, but it was causing uh, these piezoelectric effects that were, because of all the pressure from the earthquake, it was actually creating ionized plasma above the church, which was uh, actually different from uh, the sun of it. Uh, so it was like three different things going on all around the same time over there. Yeah, totally yeah, send that to me. Um, because of the fact that uh, the Vatican's preparing to have new uh, recommendations on dealing with apparitions, you know? Uh, and I wonder uh, if earthquakes, there's a lot more of that energy in the atmosphere because the earthquake, and we are having kind of like a, a anomalous uh, climate conditions right now due to a pole shift and uh, you'll see that there's a lot more, um... Don't you turn this into a doomer space. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going right back to normal stuff. Uh, I promise. Uh, and everybody knows I did quit the doom room. I'll be, uh, doing, uh, the Anjali space will be the last, 
uh, what I do with the Doom Room, but I am still open to, you know, if I have, I still will host Doom Spaces, you'll still catch me with friends sometime. Um, so yeah, the, I, I'm not with the Doom Room anymore, but it's okay. I, I see lots of success for them. Um, anyways, uh, with the pole shift, oh, near the South Atlantic Anomaly, that's what I was trying to get to. South Atlantic Anomaly, there's an uptick in phenomena activity. And uh, that is a an area of um, weakened, like a uh, reduced gravity field. And I wonder if there's some kind of correlation, you know, earthquakes, obviously there's some kind of impact energetically. Um, what uh, the conditions of the, the magnetic field would have on uh, apparitions and things like that. Well, uh, before I forget, before yeah, that, I forget about it, right. before I forget about it, I put in the purple pill links and description of the John Alexander podcast. Thank you, Science Bob. Oh yeah, I'm gonna check that out. All right, uh, EMC squared, and then uh, elections. Then back over to Sarah. I uh, joined this conversation rather late, maybe about fifteen or twenty minutes ago. And I'm understanding that maybe you're also talking about apparitions as well. So I'd like to chime in a little bit. I'm 70 years old. I've had three separate incidents having to do with I don't know what it was, but I know it wasn't coming out of my mind. Secondly, although I'm not an expert at it, I didn't study UF uh, uh, apparitions uh, as a formal course, but I have been involved in translating letters from one Melanie to various people, and she actually was a person who, along with the young boy, saw an apparition in France. That apparition spoke with her in the language of, uh, it's a French dialect, but didn't understand this child, didn't understand because she was speaking Akatan, which is another Pyrenees dialect. And apparently the apparition immediately turned to Akatan from the language she was speaking. And the word that she actually said was apple of the earth, which is pomme de terre. And if you wanted to say that word exactly the way it said, it's apple of the earth, but we're talking about a potato. Um, thirdly, there have been apparitions literally all over Europe in Russia, Japan, Kentucky, Egypt. The one in Egypt was interesting. That's called Our Lady of Zaytun, and it only occurred at night. And the apparition showed up as a woman with uh, basically wearing a shawl over her head, dressed in long clothes. And that apparition appeared to be white like smoke and just sort of hovered over this church. Here's what made it interesting. There were over 50,000 people in the streets watching this, so either they were hysterical and mass hysteria was happening, and film was recording mass hysteria up in the air, and it didn't exist, it didn't happen, or something happened. And it didn't just happen on one night, it happened consecutively many nights. Each one of these apparitions that have shown up to different people, some of them have been Jesus Christ. Now look, listen to me carefully. I'm only telling you about this. I'm reporting to you what I know. Please, for heaven's sakes, you know, don't, don't challenge me. Go challenge what it is that I know and where I read it. I'm not telling you I believe this or I disbelieve it. I'm telling you simply what I know. Things that I have read, the letters that I have translated from French into English for, just understand that I did this. So, this is interesting to me, this room, because it underscores something that I already had a knowledge of, and I'm delighted to see so many people in one place talking about this. And there is extreme, there's a lot of knowledge in this room. You just keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to drop down the listener because I understand you need speakers, uh, mics. I thank you for the opportunity to share what I know. Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Uh, feel free to stay up and join the discussion. 
uh, we'll go over to elections and then back over to Sarah. Hey, folks. Um, and MC, thank you so much for that testimony. And, you know, on my behalf, I mean, I, I maybe speak for everybody else. Thank you for being here and hope you come back. My question is going to be quick for Science Bob. How are you, buddy? Um, Doing great, man. Um, I'm glad you had a good time at Reno. Layla said you all had a big one, and I saw some of the photos. My question is this. The craft that you all saw, are those the same orbs you think that come to visit you regularly, or is this a different phenomenon than what you normally experience? The, the, the ones we saw, uh, we've seen here uh, at uh, the home Lala and I live in. Uh, but this was in Nevada, and uh, the circle got together, meditated, and called them in, and within five minutes, they were coming in, including one that started off as a big 40-foot orange orb that had an amber light on it. So I have not seen that one before that night. Do you, do you think that it's the same? You dropped out. Do you think it's the same phenomenon generally? Yeah, generally. It's generally what I see when we have CE5-like events. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon, Bob, and everybody else have a good night. Thanks yeah, for have the a good conversation. Evening. Thanks, th thanks for coming in. Thanks, Peck. Uh, he was a spirit, yep, and then a paranormal homage. Cool. Thank you again. This is a cool space. Uh, Obviously. So my question was for Bob too, but anyone's anyone can answer really. Um, I'm curious about this sighting that you had, Bob, uh, with the orb this week, or maybe in the past even too. This might apply with the, some of these orb sightings. Do you feel like uh, like they're conscious or they're they you can kind of like connect with them on a sentient level? Are you watching them float around? And you're not getting any feelings. You know what I mean? Do you have a download or? Does an epiphany come days later? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, if that makes sense. If you could tell that, if they're... That, that, that's, a, yeah. sir, that's a terrific question. So in the moment, in the moment, I have never had a sentient uh, telepathic contact. But I have had things come to me later that I felt were associated. But again, this is not evidence. This is just my belief. Very interesting. Paranormal Orange. Pen and orange. I'm sorry to pronounce that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, cool. Yes, yeah, I just wanted to chime in to say that as someone who's had reptilian abductions, if you look at other people who've had reptilian abductions, including my own, there's lots of times they'll come right up to you while you're fully awake. Like, I, the brains tend to use more anesthesia or more like electronic anesthesia. Because of the size differential, and because humans are obviously greater physical threat to them, and they're harder to manage, whereas reptilians don't need to use as much like anesthesia. So if you look at a lot of reptilian abduction cases, you would be wide awake, and the reptilian would just walk into your house. Not you have lying in bed, or they would just stick. It's so I would look look at some of those cases just as as an example of no, it's not it's not always something that starts in the middle of the night. You know, just something that's, you know, always associated with sleep paralysis or history of sleep paralysis. Panorama Normal, do you ever have lucid dreaming? I don't. I've never had a sleep disorder. I've never had the uh, uh, sleep paralysis. No, no, that, 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 that's not had, the intent of my question. The intent of my question is, uh, yeah, the lucid, my question is, I have lucid dreams that I couldn't tell the difference yeah, between awake. I was awake or not until I did the inspection that you normally do if you're a lucid dreamer to see if you're dreaming lucidly or not. So I think a lot of you could have an experience and it be inside a lucid dream or astral projection, you wouldn't even know whether or not it was in there or not. Well, I'm just saying with other with other rhetorical attitudes as well, there's a high, well, just to answer your question on lucid dreams, I mean, I've had dreams where I'm so exhausted that you can't, it's hard to tell, you know, are you, are you sleeping or are you awake? Um, but I can't say there's a pattern 
most reptilian abductees, and even in my own abductions, where they will walk up to you completely, when you're not out of it at all. You're not paralyzed, you're, not, you're, you're, you're fully conscious. And a lot of that, too, is because their style of abduction, very often they want you physically to do things on your own. They'll be like, we're parked outside, get up, let's go, we're going to walk. We're going to gently float you out like the greatest world. It, I'm just making I'm just making the point that in general, as far as like physical effects, I mean I've come on many spaces, I've talked about this, you know, many times, but I had my color blindness accidentally cured in a my lab a couple of years ago. And that my lab was in a human military facility, a human American military facility. There were different types of alien there was reptilians, there was grains, there was humans. But it was pretty clear that it was being run by our military. It wasn't, it wasn't what you'd call a joint base. It was basically just a military base that happened to have some, you know, foreign contractors working there, and those contractors just happened to not be human. So, um, I just wanted to interject as far as that. I think, you know, the Greys, they kind of overdo it on the anesthesia, and I understand why they do. You look at the size differential between human and an average size brain, and uh, I would overdo it on the anesthesia as well. If I had a button, you know, a dial or a button, and I was, I would uh, anesthetize a human, it's coming into the bedroom, I would blast, I would blast the anesthesia knob all the way to 10 to make them as, you know, <laughs> out of it as possible, just for my own safety. So I think that that kind of produces, you know, an effect where a lot of encounters with them are going to seem kind of dreamlike, but that's just because they're using electronic means to make it as docile as possible for their own safety. I think most of the experience, I'm not discounting anything you're saying, but I think most of the experiences I know that have uh, waking experiences with uh, reptilians, it begins as a screen memory where they're convinced the thing they're facing is a human being and slowly that fades. Now, that, that's not everybody. I'm not claiming that's all, all of them. I'm saying some I know that's what happens. But I don't doubt in some cases, especially after they've accepted the reptilian as something they want to interact with, they'll just walk up because they're pretty bold. Oh, oh yeah. They're, and they do major damage. I know an abductee who had his dryer, his steel door to his dryer bent in half because the reptilian was just coming into his house and the dryer was open. And he was just, you know, was mad the door was in his way, kicked the door, bent a steel dryer door in half. That's not the kind of thing a, you know, a serial apparition can do easily. Um, yeah, they, they, I mean, the same thing when you get bruises from them, they're big ass bruises. I mean, I've, I've gotten baseball sized bruises from them multiple times with them not even trying to produce a bruise like that, just grabbing me. So, yeah, they're physically. It's a different ball game than the great stuff. I mean, the great stuff are just, you know, um, more professional on how to do everything. Well, most people, including me, think they're cybernetic organisms devoid of any emotion. Uh, I mean, I disagree. I know they're from, like, an insect heritage. I know, I know that for a fact. And that makes them seem mechanical. But so, you know, if you look at uh, bees and wasps or any kind of, you know, hive, hive bugs, they... It appeared to be the same sort of wonderful uh, type of uh, behavior. And you have uh, There are seven div several different types of grays, are there not? Uh, I, there's, I've only seen a couple of myself, and I literally only saw two of the small ones, and that was in that military facility. Right before the accident, I fixed my color blindness. But I haven't seen any tall ones. I haven't seen any mantids personally. I was told during a really rough military interrogation that I have, you know, that I've got some gray in me, which would explain why when I was a really young kid, my medical file specifically said I was only allergic to mothballs and offspring. Literally, as a kid, like, the things I was allergic to was anything that bothered a bug. <laughs> it's like, well, that would explain why. Um, and I also bring up all these people who've had abductions and experiences with manids. Have they ever tried mothballs, offspring? It's, it sounds funny, but, you know, bugs are pretty universally bothered by certain things chemically. Let us explain why the greys are so obsessed with environmentalism. Because, again, just like earth bugs, they're more sensitive to pollution. 
Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if any tests have been done. Uh, I saw Parsi jumped up. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? Hey, Astro. How you doing? Um, I think the or orbs are a hot topic, eh? Um, the last time you and I co-hosted the space, um, I got back onto Christian space, and the wildest shit happened, man. I can't even explain it. Um, we were speaking about how the phenomenon is multifaceted, and we started speaking about how the phenomenon is primarily consciousness-based manifesting as nuts and bolts and choosing to manifest itself differently to different people. So I started speaking about my aunt and uncle that passed away from COVID um, and then shit just went crazy. I was looking at the sky and I could see the craft flashing at me while I was looking at it. Um, it zipped from left to right and right in front of my eyes, more than 30 plus orbs started manifesting. So they start manifesting from one point of origin and they would fly off in different directions um, and every time the orbs show up in my life it's always been 10 20 30 seconds but the more I've been in this space with Christian it's gone from one minute two minutes and now they gave me six minutes worth of footage and every time I have to ask them can I have your permission to film and they said go right ahead so I ended up filming six minutes plus of the orbs last time um, uh, put it up um, in, in, in the nest uh, to have a look at the video and um, I asked them, I said, um, who are you? And they gave me a weird cryptic answer. They said, we are us and you are you. Uh, you are us and we are you and then I asked again who are you and these words came in my mind and they said we are the heavens that's all they said and I'm still trying to make sense of um, these experiences now the very next day after this experience I'm sorry uh, back up a little bit myself Christian and Nathaniel Nathaniel had his first orb experience they're in the States and I'm in Melbourne Australia Literally, maybe a couple of minutes after my experiences, they described exactly the same thing. And no, it's not Starlink, because Starlink came by earlier, and Starlink goes in one diagonal line. These were manifesting from one point of origin and flying off in different directions. Um, the very next day after the orbs came, um, the helicopter harassment started over my place. And it was about 10.32 in the morning. I was compelled mentally, psychically, to go out on my balcony, pull out my camera, and I filmed this helicopter right above my place or a five-story building. I've only got four seconds of footage. Um, I managed to take a couple of shots with my phone, and in the shots I can see a black triangular craft right above the sky as the helicopter is going past. And in the four-second footage, I can see the black triangular craft turn white and run straight after the helicopter. It's just the craziest shit. I have no idea how to explain this. I want to point out one thing. I'm not claiming this, I want to, but I want to point out one thing. Uh, when you get uh, a night with many meteors, they appear as if they all come from one point and go outward from that one point. Now, I'm not claiming what you saw as meteors, but that is what a meteor storm looks like. Yeah, and it could be, Bob, absolutely. I'm not, I, I have no idea what these things are, but the thing is they would manifest and meteors actually fall downwards. These were going in different directions and it looked like they were manifesting in reality and then fading out. Um, and it was, it was, it was the most bizarre experience. I've never had this experience before where the, uh, the phenomenon kind of manifests. Um, and prior to that as well, like I popped it up on, um, I, I just made a small YouTube channel cause this is happening almost on a daily basis. These orbs started coming closer and closer. So I'd, I'd be walking by the river, fellow experiencers were, were speaking about the experiences and these orbs would be flying right over my head. Um, over like a 10-story building, almost like the ones Chris Bredzo sees, but I've got a shitty iPhone, so um, I can't really film. Um, I, I, it, the, the quality of the footage isn't that great, but it's it's happening almost on a daily basis. Yeah, it seems it, to yeah. be happening worldwide. Yeah, the, all, all the, the first major orbs I saw were me standing right next to Chris Bledso. and since then, the orbs that I see appear in the same way they might even be kin to his. They appear in the sky, they're bright, they move however they're going to move, and then they fade out in the sky. So they don't go from horizon to horizon ever. Yeah, and um, I tried to basically zoom in on two or three of the orbs, and it's crazy. It's like you can see faces. One looks like the face of a skull. It's like a red face. Um, 
maybe late, uh, late last year I filmed what looked like a drone that was going across my balcony and it looked when I zoomed in on the or the drone slash orb looked like there was a face of a gray alien staring back at me. So I'm yeah, having so, so, so many weird experiences. Yeah, Parsi, Lala Bride and I have multiple videos where if you gra screen grab, and they're available for everyone to go look at, by the way, a uh, 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 video we look, where we do a screen grab, you see these gray alien faces in what looks like the tube of light as it's zigzagging around. And I just wanted you to know, Linda Thompson has analyzed them and agree agrees with us. So uh, this is really interesting, Parsi. Yeah, like I, I think I reached out to you to maybe I know I know Chris Bledsoe is a pretty important guy and he's really um, um, busy and stuff. But if you can perhaps just get the word out, like I'm on Instagram, I've sent him messages, but I'm sure he gets a lot of crazy people on there. And my aim is really not nothing to do with fame or fortune. It's just trying to get answers like the rest of us in here. You know, I mean, Pat Armage has been through direct uh, contact. Uh, Marcy, I, want, I need to apologize. For, I've been, for a week, I've been busy and traveling, and I went to a Spaced Out Radio thing in Nevada, and I did not pass your message along, but I will tonight. That's okay. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. Um, I was um, requested by people here in the community to set up a GoFundMe so I can get better equipment, and I'm really ashamed to say that, but I've, I've set something up, and if anyone wants to donate, I would really appreciate it. It doesn't have to be much, and I'm not a liar or a grifter or a scammer. Uh, I'm just having these crazy experiences, and I have no points of reference for them, but um, I'm here for everyone. My DMs are open. If anyone wants to reach out to me to speak about my experiences with reptilians, mantids, greys, please reach out. And thank you, Astro, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate you. Uh, par Parsi, I have an Aurora Pro that I'm not going to use. Let's just discuss it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Man, I love that. Making connections, networking in the community. That's what it's all about. Uh, I saw big... <laughs> Baby Ashton, <laughs> what's up? Oh, shucks. I love the name. Talk. It's past my bedtime. Don't tell Ashton, though, because he's currently live on YouTube. Yo, I'm sorry. Ain't nobody here give a fuck about Ashton. Sorry. Uh, next, we'll go to Paul and then elections. Thanks, Astro. Yeah, I just want to... Uh... Uh, just give, give a little bit of my perspective um, as a as as a, a self proclaimed experiencer as well as a skeptic. I think it can be extremely difficult to be in that position. Where like so, I uh, I started off in, in my life uh, very interested in this subject as a child. I read like all the time life books, watched unsolved mysteries, sightings, all that stuff. And I kind of drifted away from it, and then I started having experiences. But it still took about probably five years, from 2016 to 2021, where I was having these experiences, and I wrote them off as sleep paralysis and dreams and, and lucid dreams and, and all of this stuff. You know, I even got to the point where uh, I, I looked into astral projection, and I'm like, well, it's it's just astral projection, as if... As if that even makes sense. How can something be just astral projection, you know? Like, that that's a, a can of worms in and of itself. And so then, I, I got these physical marks on my leg, uh, these puncture wounds, uh, which I've shared a lot before. I, I have a, a podcast coming up. I, I've announced it in some other spaces. So I'll just say I, uh, I, I recorded a talk with Whitley Strieber. I'm going to be on Dreamland uh, coming out in, like, a, a couple of weeks. And... We share some of the stuff, but I don't really, uh, and, and it was great, by the way. It was an honor to be on there. I I really, really enjoyed talking to Whitley. I think he's a total sweetheart, um, just a, a very compassionate person, an extremely good listener, very intuitive, very empathic. So it, it was fantastic being on there. But uh, nonetheless, so, you know, a, a crucial part of, of the interview especially the free version, and I wish it wasn't broken up to, into a free and members version, but maybe I can I can uh, share the, the uh, members version on Twitter once it comes out. I might do a space where we can just listen to that. Um, a lot of it was focused on the physical evidence that I provided, and so 
like I was saying, I, I'm an experiencer, but I'm also a skeptic. And that's, that's an extremely difficult place to be. You know, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of my own experiences. I'm skeptical of other people's experiences. And I'm particularly skeptical of physical evidence, video evidence, photo evidence, all of that stuff. Not to say that I think it's all BS by any means. I'm just kind of fed up with it in, ter in, in, in so far as those forms of evidence being a, uh, a, a good route for us to go when it comes to coming to terms with the reality, in my opinion, the, the true reality of the, these anomalous phenomena that we are dealing with. I truly believe that there is something, call it paranormal, I don't really like those labels, but I do think there is something paranormal, supernatural, whatever, so something that we don't understand, something that can probably be explained by science, like Screen is saying, uh, but we don't understand right now. I do think that that, that that is going on. But but like I said, I'm kind of I'm kind of fed up with a lot of this uh, physical evidence, including my own. So I don't blame anybody who who uh, if they watch this thing with Whitley Strieber and, and some other projects that I've done, some projects I've going I've got coming up where you're going to see these markings that I got. I don't blame anybody who's not convinced by them either. So where I've arrived at personally is just really focusing on the experiences themselves, getting to know experiencers, getting to know, you know, uh, figures in my real life, you know, friends who've, who've experienced things, family members, many of which who have had these shared experiences, shared instances of missing time directly associated with orbs and UFOs, people who have had shared uh, visitations or abductions, whatever you want to call them, uh, and, and just generally taking in all of that information and sort of um, aggregating it and comparing it with my own, my own experiences, and, uh, yeah, that, that's the stuff that I, I really focus on because to me, it, it, it took a really long time. Like I said, it took like five years before I even began to consider that I might be an experiencer despite the mounting evidence. And then now it's been another three, four years since then. Uh, I, I'm, I'm finally, I just reached the point where I, I just unequivocally think that there is something going on and so we could debate till the cows come home whether like chris bledsoe's orb videos are are uh, verifiable and, and and for the record i am a chris bledsoe fan i i'm a let's uh, let's say i'm a i'm a believer uh when it comes to you know most of his stuff but you know pe people will just just debate these videos and debate all of this stuff. And I'm just, I'm so sick of it. Like I think, so in closing, I think that this stuff goes so far beyond videos and physical evidence, even though, the, even though that stuff is extremely important and was extremely important to me when I got these, these puncture wounds on my leg, I think what this is really about is simply acknowledging that there is so much more to our reality than meets the eye. And by that, I mean things like astral, what you, uh, you know, work with like remote viewing, you know, t telepathic experiences, uh, various other consciousness based stuff. And yes, including the UFO phenomenon and, uh, apparitions, ghosts, you know, you name it. I, I am utterly convinced that there is something to that stuff and that, that our reality is just so much more magical and interesting and, and, and above all else mysterious than some people might think so I, I again i apologize for being defensive uh towards third i i did come in hot but when i when i sense that somebody is dismissing all anomalous experiences across the board it's really difficult for me in my current position sometimes at least not to be defensive because like i i am also a skeptic i understand the skeptic viewpoint but i also i fully believe that there is so much interesting stuff going on so i really hope that that resonated with some people and thanks for i, I just want to i want to join you i want to join you so so I, i'm a scientist i've been a scientist 
since I was a kid, but now I have a PhD in the science. So I, I am a scientist. And ethically speaking, I'm a skeptic. And that's the only thing a good scientist can be is a skeptic. But I'm not going to be an asshole to people that have experiences. I may not believe their experience, but I'm not going to bust them in the chops with, with, a, with a verbal fist uh, because, you know, they're going through something and I don't want to contribute to their trauma. And I'm going to tell you straight up, Paul, I think Ferd has been through trauma and he's still dealing with it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But it's just, it, I just don't think it helps to bust them, bust them in their chops verbally or any other way. But I completely agree with your skeptical stance because that's the only ethical thing you can do. And on the evidence, I, I do not have the world's greatest evidence. I just put it up for everybody to look at and see fit. I haven't shown it to a single scientist claiming they can do science with it because I know they can't. But anyway, that was a, that was a, great, that was a great thing, Paul. Thank you so much, Bob. And I, I've, I've admired you from, from afar a little bit. I know I, I briefly ran into you at the Inquirer Anomalous Conference like two years ago or something. And uh, I, I love your work, too. And I really appreciate that response. And I agree with what you said. I, I remember it. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, so uh, I, I know we have a lot of hands up, so I'm not going to alienate the conversation. <laughs> but uh, I just saw uh, on Gonzalo, Gonzalo Chavez. He posted an hour ago that on the latest episode of Heine and the Sons podcast, he shared a significant update on the Nazca Mummies case. He announced a major le legal victory against the Peruvian government, where the Peruvian Ministry of Culture was found liable in a $300 million lawsuit for a disinformation campaign and defamation of researchers. If you're using the speaker by phone, it, it's a little rough. Yeah, that last bit was jumbled there, if you want to repeat Oh, uh, Hyman Masson said that uh, he won the lawsuit against the Peruvian government and that they were found liable in the $300 million lawsuit. Bring on the mummies. Let's get it. Go mummies. It's mummies day. It was happy mother mummies day. <laughs> Sounds like it, honestly. <laughs> $300 million. And it's supposed to go to research uh, of the mummies and things like that. Equipment. <laughs> They should have released some more info on Mummy's Day. Now that I think about it, it could have been like one of those publicity stunts. Could have been huge, right? <laughs> uh, Ursula, I saw you jumped up. What's up? Um, hey, um, I was just going to ask um, Science Bob like, if he ever got a chance to look at my videos. And I do feel like Paul also, um, you know, like people always... There's more people that have been, you know, in my comments lately saying, oh, those are not what you're seeing or, you know, that I just, I, it, it does get tiring, you know, when you see these things. I don't, I don't know what they are. I don't even consider myself an experiencer. I'm more of a, uh, I think at times, uh, not, I don't know what I am at this point, but, you know, I've seen things since I was little. Um, I've, um. I guess my parents said I used to see a little man in, in the closet. I don't know if that was a gray. I, I have, a, I'm still terrified of the dark. Um, there's so much that I don't understand even as an adult. Like, um, and then my sister passed away and I started seeing orbs, more orbs than I've ever seen in my whole life. And I just, I do wonder if they're connected. Um, and you know, I, I, um, see them on a regular basis. I've, also seen the traditional like uh triangular ufos and but you know at this point in my life like sometimes i just want answers i don't know if i'll ever get the answers i want i mean there's a lot of a lot of us that want answers and you know and I, that's what i love about these spaces you know we just want answers and i i do get tired of people saying oh you know you're you're just seeing starling and it's not starling you know i know how starling looks i know how planes look and so um at the end of the day i just want you know, some answers, and I don't know if I will ever get the answers that I want, you know, just seeing these things my whole life, I, um, I think, I don't know, I've had trauma at a young age, um, I think a, li a little bit of people know the things that happened to me, but, you know, I, I don't know if it was from that point on that I think around five years of age that I started seeing things, and I don't know if that has to do with anything as well, so, but anyway, thank you for letting me speak, Astral and Tiff and Science Bob. Well, Ursula, I apologize for not getting back to you. I did look at your videos, and they are 
each of them is similar to about half of the things that Lala and I record, and I think they're exactly what you say they are. So don't and and it's, uh, we don't have any fear from the things we see. I do not know the nature of your interaction with them, so I'm not going to comment on whether or not you should fear them. But they look exactly like half the things we see, and uh, I believe I passed along a message. Uh, from you to Chris Bledsoe, and I hope, uh, I hope, I hope that worked out. Thank you. Road trip. Let's get it. Yo, I'm about to take a road trip to get the uh, Dorothy Azad footage that has been released this summer. So <laughs> that should be an interesting one. Screen, what's up, dude? And then over to elections, and then Money Penny's got her hand up too. Oh man, uh, it's been awesome combo. Um, I was like zoned out listening to everybody. I forgot the points I was going to make because uh, I'm driving. I usually got little notes next to me, but uh, I shared the stuff on Earth Lights. Um, you know, it's it kind of uh, shows how volcanoes can you know produce some of the phenomena or volcano. Uh, earthquakes produce some of the phenomena like the lights and stuff people see uh there's this vo volcano that erupted it's called like uh i can't i can't ever remember the name it's like uh fukusama or something like that but basically there was so much pressure like when it erupted that it, right before it starts erupting it shoots a green laser out of it like straight up into space um so like that's i, I shared a on Professor Simon's channel, he interviews Paul Devereaux, and he talks all about Earth lights. Uh, you know, when I filmed the orbs uh, in my mom's driveway, that was when we, uh, it, like, earth, earthquake we had over here, and we never have earthquakes, right? So there's, like, uh, a lot of that stuff correlates. And uh, also, um, like, uh, people seeing different things, like the lady and stuff like that, I think that's because of, uh, like, w the belief we, like kind of put to it when when we're experiencing things like in my sleep paralysis uh thing uh I, in my mirrors infinity mirrors which uh you know that's distorting em waves right and uh it's disrupting how you perceive things um that's why a lot of this stuff is revolves around like moonlight or uh mirrors all that type of stuff uh for the altered states but um basically because i didn't have any belief kind of tied to anything i saw a plasma orb you know, not in my room, only in the mirror. A plasma orb with a cloaked, like, lady uh, being with it, like, kind of between her hands. Um, you know, and now thinking back on it, I almost wonder if that's not just, like, uh, this my avatar, and that was me seeing, like, my energy, you know. And uh, when, when you're dealing with waves and stuff, distortions and stuff like that, you're, like, that's why you usually hear, like... Uh, robes or uh, the woman because y you see long hair right so you kind of automatically say oh that's a woman right like you don't really hear these stories about seeing dudes with long hair um so you know even uh all my experiences are usually when i'm kind of like checked out right like i'm i'm awake but i was like real deep in thought or like not caring what's going on here but not here right um it, it's like, I really just encourage people to, like, really check out the science behind this stuff. I know I sound like a broken record, Steve. but like I said, it just answers so many questions. Steve, do you think that, that that state of consciousness, that liminal state, could actually be an access point for potentially other intelligences or other realms? Yeah, 100%. Uh, I think that's the Akashic record, uh, 369, that Tesla talks about that that point in the toroid right that position uh because if we're if everything's connected uh there has to be an access point right so i think that's probably what's going on there yeah. we're just disrupting how we you know view everything because like i said if we're in a light matrix it would stand to reason that it's kind of all stacked on top of each other right so that can be distorted so i was used to when i travel for the government a lot i spent a fair amount of time in mexico so at popocatapetl during an eruption I saw a flying saucer around the top of Popocatapetl, and it was caught on video. And that's not some lightning laser, lightning bolt or whatever. It was a flying saucer. 
And then I went out at night to Teotihuacan, and I saw orbs all around the sun, the sun palace. The sun pyramid, I mean. So this stuff happens. Wasn't there like a recent Most movie about volcano with like a triangle that came out too? Like a triangle flying above it? That's a Popocatapetl. That was the same one? Same one. That is the most active volcano in Mexico. And there's cameras on it, and they, they broadcast the weird stuff uh, live all the time from that volcano. Hey, Bob, I just wanted to say... Yeah, that's a great point. I want to uh, go to back to that real quick. My bad. Uh, because the stuff uh, that doesn't fit our like uh, technology technology evolution uh it's it's basically you have things like basel switzerland or nuremberg germany right but you only hear of this stuff like uh black triangles or spheres or spheres and tubes right so if we're if we're saying we're in a light matrix then essentially when that stuff is distorted maybe we're just seeing the inner workings with that stuff right like when you look at ourselves through a microscope or whatever they look like little machines and you're gonna it's geometry right like you have uh the kabbalion symbol the circle triangle and the square uh all most ufos that can't be explained are all going to fit those patterns somehow uh because it's it's all just like how things work well anybody this goes back and reads uh jacques valet uh Passport to Magonia knows that he is at le he he and uh, both John Keel are serious proponents of the weird stuff's been going on forever, and the people who watch it contribute to how it looks. Yeah, it's just like a control system that conforms to the individual person to make the message be able to be delivered through ever through whatever means necessary, you know, of figures that in a dream or, you know, state where they can get the message. I love that interpretation, uh, Astral. All right, we'll go to elections and then uh, Money Penny. Hey, folks. Um, you know, it seems to me like this whole phenomenon is um, it's picking up. It seems like there's a quickening. And, oh, and bring on the mummies, by the way. Um, so it may be perceptual. It, it may be that, you know, the activity is, you know, a lot of observers say that activity has been picking up since we got the bomb. But it seems like it's really picking up of late. There's a whole lot of people that are testifying to their experiences. I'm just throwing this out generally to the group. Do, do folks feel like there is something of a serious additional, um, you know, momentum and force going on right now? And if so, what should we draw from it? Is this the NHI forcing the issue? I'm just curious about everybody else's thoughts. But it feels to me like there is definitely a, an, an enhanced level of involvement and presentation. Well, I can tell you, Chris Bledsoe says the, the, the bigger stuff is coming this year and next, and it's ramping up, and he is now participating uh, in multiple events where people ask him to wish the things there, and it's being done successfully. In other words, every time they interact with him and he wishes the craft to show themselves to them, they show up. And that's, begin that's beginning to re really ramp up. And I suspect, look, Chris lost a fortune when he came out with this stuff. And he's got a movie deal and he's going to make, make a movie about all of his experiences and his life. And I am absolutely certain the producers and director of that movie have told him to go out and make these things show up so it'll be promote have big promotional value for the movie. But I can tell you that is happening. Things are really ramping up, and he claims they're going to continue. What does everybody think is the real cause for this accentuated activity? Look, so, so let's, let's say, let's say uh, there was an event, and all of a sudden, once the event became known, Lots of people all around the world started paying attention and looking at the sky. And as more people saw more stuff, it built. 
That has been going on since the Nimitz story came out, is that more and more people are looking, more and more people are seeing, and more and more people follow. Like a collective awareness. It's just collective awareness is increasing, and like all things exponential, it looks slow at first, but then it ramps up and explodes. Uh, Okay, well, let's assume that that's the case, that people are more aware. Does everybody still think at the same time that there's more activity or just more awareness? Well, I think it's both. I think as, as, as awareness increases, the phenomenon takes notice of that awareness and it causes essentially a feedback loop, right? Like the more aware you are of it, the more you're able to, the more it kind of presents itself to people and yeah, it just repeats. I like that, Paul. Good points. Go ahead, Money Penny, jump in. Hey there, thanks for letting me speak. Um, fascinating people. Um, I put an article in the um, NAS just because I wanted uh, to talk orbs, obviously, uh, with Bob here. I don't know whether Bob has seen this article, but I wanted to ask him a question about it. Um, oh, by the way, Ashton has just finished his live broadcast and he realised that orb is bro, spelt backwards. So he keeps going bro, bro to his chat people, which is all very strange. I think it's very odd, don't you? Wait, why did you kick out that baby Ashton person? That wasn't very nice. I thought they were very entertaining. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, orbs generally. So this US Navy report from 2019 describes these orbs um, coming in and out of the water. I mean, um, it seems to know a lot about these orbs, this Navy press release, as it is, uh, which was filmed in the Combat Information Center of the USS uh, Amaha on July the 15th, 2019. My question really is, have the orbs that people have seen in this room had a similarity to these orbs that the um, US Navy have been uh, producing? I mean, um, seeing, visualizing, uh, press releasing? So, Money Penny, thanks for that. So, this is the same collection of of uh, craft or whatever you orbs or whatever you want to call them that Jeremy Corbell made famous when he released videos taken by crew members that were on those ships. And at the end of that, there was a crew member who videoed a screen that was in the uh, in uh, one of the the sensor stations on board a vessel. And they saw the orb splash into the ocean. So it appears to me that slowly but surely the Navy is affirming this and letting out. But they already said those videos were real. And they had, that given the Snoopy teams were on board, I'm going to tell you what my belief is. I don't have evidence and nobody's told me this. But I know what a Snoopy team is. I believe they went out there with what they thought were the ability to summon those things. They did it, didn't really tell the crew, and the Snoopy team got on deck and recorded everything they could to help whoever's going to look into this for the Navy. I believe that that that, that cruise by those multiple vessels was done on purpose to try to attract the orbs to show. Right, fascinating. So my initial theory was that the orbs were actually advanced military technology being tested by the Navy. So this is prior to speaking with you, obviously. I, I, let me, let me, I, I keep saying this, and I'm going to say it again and again and again. When you test secret stuff, you do not test it over active military uh, uh, things because of the chance for a really bad mistake being made. That puts the people on board those vessels at risk, and it puts the people who are acting uh, to make the craft go at risk. And the, 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 the reason I am certain they went out there looking for it is that they flew in the controlled airspace in which a commander of any one of the vessels had the right to shoot at it and shoot it down because it was a perceived threat, and they did not do so, which says to me, as a person who's been out with the Navy several times, they were ordered not to. So I think they went out there looking for the things and found them, and uh, that the Navy is going to, to admit that it happened. But they... 
the the secret U.S. government facilities that build secret planes, secret ships, secret rockets, whatever, secret drones, they do not test them over an active military place because of the danger of something ugly happening. Mm, interesting, because on the Lockheed Martin website and on the patents that I've seen, there are certainly lots of orbs that are being tested by the U.S. military that are outside the DARPA FOIA requests because they're being done. I, I, I absolutely believe you, Money Pen. I believe that that is true, but they're not going to test them over a bunch of vessels for the because of the danger of a bad accident. Okay, so uh, the question really is, when you've seen orbs, do they come um, alone? Is it just one orb? Do you see triangular formations of orbs? Do you see them making the same sort of patterns that we've observed in the video of the MH370, whether or not it's fake, true, or whatever. I'm not disputing that at the moment. Just want to know, when orbs are seen, are they seen on their own, in groups? Do they go in and out of water? Are they always in triangular formations or quadrant formations? Are you, who are you addressing, Monday Penny? I missed I think to you, Bob. That was you. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So, all of the above. Okay, so you have seen orbs traveling on their own with no other orbs in sight. I ha I've had triangle of orbs in my front yard. I've seen tr orbs traveling alone in my yard and standing next to Chris Bledsoe and this last weekend in Reno, Nevada. So uh, I've seen them um, travel in groups. I've seen them do dances in the sky. I've seen all of the above. And are they of a similar size? Because there's a very specific size mentioned in that Navy um, press release. The, 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 the amber ones that uh, sometimes have a bright amber light on them, like the one we saw last weekend, and the ones I saw well, uh, standing next to Chris Bledsoe, those are 40-foot orbs that fo fo go through the sky uh, not far above the treetops. So... Uh, uh, they're, they're various types, and I don't even claim they're all the same type. But then the other things I've seen are flashes in the sky where you can see a craft flash, like flare up and then go down. And this is called power up by people who do CE5s. And I've seen those. I saw those this past weekend, probably a dozen of them. And uh, that's what and Chris Bledsoe and I standing right next to each other, we saw hundreds of them. It was amazing. It looked like flash bulbs going off across the sky. Okay. Damn. Finally, the one that is pictured in the article that has been released in that uh, Navy video, does that resemble, do you believe that that is an accurate photographic, uh, presumably a remake of it? Uh, I haven't looked at the photo yet because when you put it in the nest, that was the first time I've seen the article. So I'll have to look at it, Money Penny. I'll, de I'll, I'll private message you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll go over to Kevin and then uh, Doomer Daddy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm relatively new to looking into a lot of the UFO stuff. I just have a quick question here, which is that um, what do you make of some people saying that a lot of the sightings close to ground are attributable to uh, ball lightning? Because I don't really, like know if there's really anything done like in terms of research on ball lightning and what your thoughts are on that thanks so i've been inter i've been interacting with uh uh people like simeon hine simeon hine right now is doing a ton of research in ball lightning and uh i've been a follower and studier of the work of ken shoulders and others for quite a long time and I don't believe these orbs that I've seen, like the 40-foot ones that go across the sky, I don't believe it's ball lightning because I don't think ball lightning lasts long enough. And, uh, and ball lightning seems to have a highly variable a level amplitude of light output where the ones, the orbs I saw were not really that variable. Sometimes they would have little modeling of their surface and slight variations, but ball lightning, the amplitude of light coming out of them varied a lot. So uh, uh, you can read Dark Matters uh, fr uh, from uh, Simeon Hine, and he is doing a ton of work in ball lightning. And right now he's the only person I know outside of Russia who's doing any serious research.
Also, the intelligent control, right? Like, aside from the science you mentioned, Bob, the fact when they when these orbs seem to be under intelligent intelligent control, I think that's a big Absolutely. factor. Absolutely. Ball lightning does not look to me like it's under intelligence control in every video and every writing I've seen. And these orbs are definitely under some kind of intelligent control. Not only that, they, they will respond to people who claim they're telepathically uh, uh, connected to them. Like my girlfriend Lala and Chris Bledsoe and uh, Melinda Leslie and Lorian Fenton and a bunch of other people I know. There is lots of ball lightning research going on. In the UK, we have built the largest ball lightning machine generator, similar to Malcolm Bendel and Randall Castle stuff. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know about it. Bob, yes. have you read uh, PK Man by Jeffrey Mitchell? Do you know? Are yes. you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah, that's an interesting book. I mean, plasma can have a consciousness based on some of the assessments that are being made. Could the conscious plasma be a manifestation that we see as ball lightning? I don't have the answer to that. Maybe somebody else does. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see why not. I'm, I'm sure Screen would, would have some opinions, but uh, I, I think that's kind of a, an unanswerable question. There, there are so many theories as to what the orbs are. I know I have my own. I like unanswerable questions. Oh, I, want, I meant to. I meant to respond. I meant to respond yeah. up, 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 to that. That I've seen. I've seen faces in many different kinds of uh, uh, orbs that I've caught on camera and not. Yeah, I wonder if they're almost like. Uh, I mean, people say they're probes. I think of it almost like. What if there was? I mean, this is getting very out there, pure speculation. But what if, like, you were on a craft or in a place somewhere, and there was almost like a kind of like a hollow deck, an area where you could um, create a portal, and then that portal could be one of these orbs, and it could move around, and, and if you stepped into the, to the range of that, you know, the first, part, the first part of the portal, it would allow you to either transport yourself through that probe, or, or uh, observe things through that probe, and uh, do... Do all sorts of things, if that makes sense. Uh, I like to use the term portal probe. <laughs> if, conscious, if consciousness can manifest as plasma, you know, organized plasma, as best we can perceive it, it can do anything, can it? I mean, it, it's consciousness. So, I mean, sky's the limit. Well, <laughs> literally. Yeah, it's like the idea from the third body problem where the two particles interact, one can act as, as an observer but it can only travel to one place. So it's a pretty cool concept. Uh, we'll throw it to the hands. A bunch of our up uh, Doomer and then over to uh, Larry. What's up, Doomer? Hey, what's up, you guys? Uh, Astral Science Bob, Tiff. Uh, the space is on fire. It's like hot, sentient plasma. Um, you guys are really running in the awesome space. I wanted to answer uh, Hicks's uh, election reforms question just from my perspective. It might be a little doomerish, but it's fucking exciting. Uh, I think this is an arms race. Um, when uh, Van, Van Neumann, when he said, tell me Russia will bomb us tomorrow, I say, why not bomb Russia today? If you say Russia bombs us at 5 p.m., I say, why aren't we bombing at 1 p.m.? I think this is an arms race between more of the old Sumerian type, between knowledge, creativity, uh, disclosure, um, meaning the truth, ingenuity, uh, versus war, domination, and suppression. And so I think there is an arms race between disclosure or literal war. Um, I think there's a narrowing time window for disclosure, and I think it's less than six months. I think it's the fucking election. And I think there's a rush. I think the, the Jason Sands, the Steves that are pouring in to, to perform a decentralized disclosure... I think many people realize if we don't make disclosure happen by the time the election happens, then war comes first, and uh, disclosure is going to be more of more of an apocalypse. It'll be it'll be the phenomenon or cataclysm or both being revealed to us. And I also think that if we make disclosure happen in time before like a nuclear world war, it'll obviate World War Three. Uh, I don't think it's possible to have. If, if we have a full catastrophic disclosure, I think World War Three or the potential gets silenced immediately. And 
maybe that triggers like an extraterrestrial World War Four, but I think we get to skip World War Three. And I also think that the closer we push, the harder we push and move the needle of disclosure, the more the reactive response will be to ramp up motions toward World War Three. I think as we push toward disclosure, we're accelerating uh, the likelihood of a, of a nuclear attack. Um, and I think it's worth it. I think we have to. I think it's a really d difficult place we're in. But I think that's what's going on. The same way you have an arms race with, with the development of the nuclear bomb, I think that's what's going on in the wars between disclosure versus an NHR that does not want disclosure. Zoomed out. Let's get it. <laughs> Go ahead, Larry. Hit that other side real quick. Yeah. Well, um... Let's see. Yeah, I, first of all, I, I agree that we are facing, I think, what is a, brand, a fork in the road. I do think it's a choice between disclosure, uh, sort of dawning up upon the whole planet, and that would stall, that would, what do you call it? Make it would unite us as well. It would unite, it would us, unite us, yes, and stave off the uh, war, make the war unnecessary. But if we don't have it, yeah. I, I definitely see, I mean, people are scrambling for it. They're peeing in their pants trying to get us into war, um, you know. And so it's going to happen. Um, but I, anyway, think people, gonna... I think people want disclosure. The thing I'm having a hard time understanding is how disclosure itself would prevent or preclude, you know, the, the conflict that we all fear. I mean... I, I just don't quite see how that adds up. Because it would reveal an enemy that would force unity. Like the Reagan idea. That's one way. Another way, which is the release of that technology, free energy, would, uh, this is in the longer term, would completely relieve tensions between countries. Um, you know, because we would be... Uh, we, we wouldn't need to fight resource wars anymore. But Be in the short, between in the classes, short term, I, between classes. Well, uh, this, this the thing about free energy is that it neutralizes all class and hierarchy. But yeah, it would have to be released worldwide. It was like a open source method instead of like through the rich people getting it first and then it works trickles its way down <laughs> you know i think it would have to be something like bitcoin or something where it's just open sourced or you know a way for people to access it and build it on their own yes and before i get before i relinquish the mic i just wanted to address elections original question which your great conversation starter always elections and this question was you know what about this uptick um, is this, how do we interpret this? Um, and I think it is in, indeed a gentle push by the ETs themselves for disclosure. And I do think that if the president were to make that capital D disclosure announcement, that the ball would be in ET's hands then, and we would then see them make the next move. And I believe abductions would stop at that point because, um, it would just be insulting and rude to continue doing them, you know. So, do you see abductions as happening currently? Richard Dolan just put uh, on the Richard Dolan show uh, an entire hour and a half on his current feelings that uh, abductions are still still going strong. Oh, well, they probably are. Okay. Uh, uh, relative to Larry's comment, and you're very sweet to say that, Larry. Thank you. Um, my, you know, today it was announced that China is thinking about jumping the shark and, you know, doing disclosure before we do. Any comments from the crowd on that? I think, I think that's, I think that's very possible. They're, they are they are really making a huge push, huge push to equal us in space, like get to the moon and put up a base, and they might jump the shark on disclosure because they do have an active, they they do have an active program looking at that uh, down craft and technology. And you can see, it, I've seen several Chinese uh, kind of uh, th uh, uh, articles and other things where it just makes me certain they have a program. 
They are also they are also being very aggressive to have a world presence. I don't necessarily think that China is the greatest threat that everybody makes them out to be, but you know they are they're going to build something on the backside of the freaking moon. That's some balls right there. There's a certain status, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, they 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 definitely want status, but I just pe pe people really kind of need to calm down about China. They they huff and puff and a lot, but here are the demographic facts. These are facts. In the next 10 years, China will lose population equivalent to the current population of the United States of America. They will not be a threat in 10 years. Economically. Wait, no, that's not true. They'll, they'll, no, they'll, still have, they'll still have 700 million people at the end of the century. They're going to be a bigger threat in 10 years than they are today. You're, you're but, making an assumption, which is false, in my opinion. And that is that they will still be the economic power in 10 years that they are now, able to generate wealth, etc. And I don't believe that that is true for, for many reasons that are, that are not relevant to this space. So, Science Bob, I'm totally aligned with you with the deglobalizational threat that China has to its own economy. Um, but don't you think from a perspective of psychological warfare, the most powerful thing they could do was, is be an emblem of free speech that puts America to shame? You know, put something on the on the far side of the moon. Show them there's structures, there's aliens. It would it would humiliate America. Well, especially since us, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, through NASA and uh, the military and the government, we have covered up what's on the other side of the moon. The Chinese are playing the game and playing it pretty well, but they are also very weak. Ultimately, I mean, they're big. They're they're growing, and they are going to be a power, and they have a right to be a power. But the idea that we are so joined to the hip to China, and whether we like it or not, we have offshored all this. And I, I think making China into an enemy is just stupider than hell, personally. If you want to know somebody that really wants to bring us down, it is Russia. It's been Russia. Hello, 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 hello. And I, I don't know. I just, uh, Russia, I mean, China is, is not a benign actor. But I don't necessarily, they've never invaded an outside country generally. They just want to have their place in the world, and I don't fault them for that. I think considering the general distrust in government, it would require China to really uh, have a, a strong advantage, you know, at some point in the future for them to, quote, like, beat us to disclosure. You know, like, I, I'm not even that optimistic about America, uh, you know, the president coming out in favor of disclosure just because there again there's so much distrust so i think things would kind of have to evolve in a certain way for that to happen with china otherwise i think america will continue for better or worse in its slow shitty way to to kind of uh, push the envelope i want to add that <clears throat> uh i want to disagree with you paul and in, in one in one just from one vector one vector only Sh schumer and others would not have written the UAP Disclosure Act without approval of the president of his party and his National Security Council. It's a good point. And so do you find that to still be encouraging? Yeah, I think it's encouraging, but I mean, Turner and what's his name from Alabama got in the way. Right. Rogers. Yes, Rogers is the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and Turner is chairman of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, and they killed the UAP Disclosure Act. Okay, so but so, uh, in other words, are you still optimistic about uh, the possibility of a, a big top-down disclosure, like the president or somebody coming out? My, my, my understanding is that in the middle of the summer, uh, big committees in the Senate are going to have hearings, and the UAP Disclosure Act will be released in some form again. Yeah, no, yeah, I've, I've heard that too. I really hope that's the case. And Schumer would not do that without the Biden administration's approval. Right, and getting in before the upcoming election, as uh, do Doomer Daddy's talking about. I think that that is an issue. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, screen, and then we'll go around to the hands, LM, and then uh, Paranormal. Uh, 
my bad, my bad, uh, bad timing. Um, yeah, so, uh, the question for the, uh, oh, well, first of all, um, the China thing, yeah, they're, uh, I'm pretty sure they're, they're they've, uh, kind of matched us as far as, like, capabilities all the way from ocean floor all the way, you know, to space, uh, like, having everything on lock. Um, that's a, that's a big worry that, um, you know, they're really pushing the drones things and they have those uh, aerogel balloons and all that stuff. So it's, uh, all that is a big concern, but it doesn't mean aliens, right? It doesn't mean disclosure. But uh, as far as like the uptick in the cycles, uh, nature, nature is a technology. It's a machine, right? It's the most efficient thing out there. When we, when we make technology, we're copying nature in a less efficient way. And, you know, people forget uh, why the, the ancients were, they were into uh, astrology, right? Um, they were astronomers. Uh, they, they knew the cycles down to a T, and it, they were that important. Um, a lot of, you'll find a lot of the cycles, the upticks, of the experiences, they happen uh, based on, like, planetary alignments, uh, orbits. Uh, they're probably, like, five to eight years, I think, is, like, uh, the range. Um, on top of that, you have different stages in life when your brain is developing, right? So a lot of people usually have their first sleep paralysis thing uh, around 11-ish, right? And then uh, there's another, like, thing, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, like, those are those are big stages in, when your brain is developing. Uh, so it's, it's little things like that that uh, we kind of just overlook. Um, Y'all were talking about the plasmas. Simeon Hines' work on that stuff's awesome. I, I sh shared a little link from when he was on Fade to Black down in the pill. Um, he talks about stealth plasmas, which is a light that's black. You, you know, it's it's basically a, like a plasma orb, but a shadow version. Uh, people don't talk about that. Uh, I also shared in the same post, uh, this dude, he's kind of going over uh, the occult, and he's talking about fairies and jinn, and he's talking about how yellow orbs are more playful or benevolent, uh, you know, stay away from the blue orbs, the red orbs do this, uh, the extra rare black orbs, uh, you know, can do this, and he, he, he was describing the different types and colors of orbs and plasmas, and, and the same type of experiences that people say when they experience the orbs is what they were talking about, except they called them jinn and fairies. Um, you know, so like all that stuff is super important and, uh, there, there comes this thing with energy, right? Uh, I think it was Larry that mentioned free energy. First of all, free energy is, it's a, it's a pipe dream, right? Like it's, it just doesn't exist. Um, you know, it's, you can have very efficient energy, uh, but not like free energy, right? Every, ten stoffel, everything costs something. Uh, but that, that's where you get into alchemy and stuff when you're transmuting things, right? And uh, you can get into some real old cases where allegedly uh, some alchemist transmuted lead to gold back in the day. Um, but their ovens, something I found super interesting, they, their ovens were massive. Like they were, they were, had to get these temperatures like super, super high, right? Um, and that's where you kind of get into like the pyramids and how they're modeled after volcanoes and uh, that's essentially like what the alchemists were doing, right? That's, that's, it's like a, like a subwoofer for like a lack of better way to explain it. It's, uh, the landscape is like music almost. You, and you even call it the, like you have uh, your hi-hats and stuff or your, uh, your valleys and your peaks, right? So it's, it's all in the language. We just, we've been around for so long that we kind of have a different view on things. But it's, um, it's very important because when you look up the old stuff, uh, when you get into the transmuting and the Philosopher's Stone or whatever, uh, essentially they're describing ionized plasma, like a, this super, super condensed energy, right? Uh, that's typically how God is described when he's talking about in the Bible and stuff. Uh, uh, energy light so bright that you can't even look at it. Um, you know, but Harvard, I think it was Harvard, they actually, they're modern day, they transmuted lead to gold, right? Um, so stuff like that can single-handedly throw the whole economy out of whack, right? And I think that's the real issue going on. Uh, that they don't want to get out. The fact that technology can disrupt the flow of how we have our, you know, things set in stone with the economy and all. And it's like, how did, that's why we have a cap on energy, right? Like when you start getting into this stuff and anti-gravity and all that, 
And if you actually tinker and do the stuff in your house or your shop or whatever, you find out real quickly that it's a power issue. You can't supply enough power, right? So you, that's why people start building like Tesla coils and stuff like that. Uh, they have to think outside of the box. And then you start tripping sensors because you're producing all this energy. And then that's, you become a target. And, you know, uh, we, we talk about... Um, like Fravor, right, with the orbs, uh, they had just installed radar. That's when Foo Fighters started popping up as well, right? Um, when we first started using radar. Um, so it's like all this stuff that it, it can kind of explain it. And he even talks about in his experience how uh, how he it mirrored him, right? Like if you start thinking of everything as a reflection of the light matrix, I know I keep going back to that. I'm just trying to like put it in perspective for people. But uh, the, the whole mirroring aspect, like if, uh, if think about when the sun hits your watch or your cell phone and then it reflects and, you know, you could blind somebody or you see the light jumping around or whatever. Think about that, but in an orb form or whatever, or the Tic Tac, you know, um, it's, it's almost like it's interfacing with the person and maybe the intelligent control is the reflection of the person and not necessarily something else, uh, you know, or it's uh, us connecting with source in a way. Um, but on top of that, if, if we did have free energy, this is why my belief as to why they keep everything under wraps. Uh, first of all, the fact that MK Ultra was when they were kind of brainwashing people with chemicals, uh, like drugs and stuff, but they figured out they could do that with frequencies or like uh, magnetic fields and stuff, right? So um, it it just kind of evolved in my opinion so the real secret is that how easy it is to hack people's perception of reality or even distort reality or like i said the, with the transmutation of lead to gold type stuff right um but if we had free energy and abundant resources uh if you pay attention to history this is why the stuff is so important just like the planetary orbit and the cycles i was talking about we go through cycles. Everything shifts. It's a pendulum. Like you, you hit the breaking point on one side, and then you start moving the other way. It's just how things work. And they did a study with rat, right? And yes, I know it's rats, but basically, what happened is anytime the rats got to like a golden age where they had abundant resources and didn't have to work for it, they quit populating. They quit working and started fighting, and and then basically civilization their civilization would like come undone and so when you get into these old uh, like mysticism teachings and stuff like that and you hear of uh, like a, a population limit and it's for things like that it's not necessarily nefarious right because uh, we're kind of like our own downfall but uh, I, I really suggest people look into that that study with the rats uh, because uh, it, pretty much people do the same thing and that's you, you have to look at the history and you have to kind of look at this stuff uh, from a different perspective, right, without biases. And I know that's hard, but uh, the, the data is there. Uh, I just encourage everybody to look for it. Thanks. Have you had a chance to follow Bob Grenier or Malcolm Bendall's work? Because he alchemy is real. It's taking a carbon atom and basically turning it into an oxygen atom. And it is an amazing technology, and it's an old technology. It's tied into the Vajras. It's tied into all the sacred mathematics. It's amazing. And it was a great comment screen. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, everything is, is crazy, but w the answers are in front of us. 100% appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, I am familiar with that stuff. I've actually been following it pretty closely, and... Uh, I, I love how they're actually testing. They're in the testing phase, right? They started shipping stuff out. Everybody came together, started building, kind of like the uh, 3D printing community. <laughs> um, but because when I actually, if you look into it, like everybody's like, oh, it's a hoax, it's a hoax. But if you actually look into it, there's not enough to actually like disprove it yet, right? So it's like uh, I'm really waiting for those results from uh, everybody that's uh, putting in. My buddy George Howard, who is putting on the Cosmic Summit, and I encourage everybody to come, has been trying to debunk Malcolm now for three plus months, actually pushing six. And he hasn't been able to do it. They've got two, you know, rigs set up with just a Honda generator and they are letting him run and they will be running all the weekend of the Cosmic Summit. And 
you know, the, the crazy part about this is it's not necessarily free energy, but it can clean up our cars. Okay, I'll take that. I mean, I really will. I'll take that. If, if, it can, if you can put in gas and not upset the big oil bastards, even though I would be happy to just topple them and say, fuck you. And I think we can with next generation energy because the government controls over 5,000 energy patents that they black shelved. So, you know, we, we know there's something else. But please come and look into next generation energy and the Cosmic Summit, folks. I hope Bob's going to be there, but I know a lot of folks are going to be there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Nice. Thanks, guys. Good nuggets there. Uh, we'll go to a bunch of the hands up. We've got LM and then Paranormal and then over to Paul, then Larry. Thanks, guys. And we have two requests to speak and no slots. We'll cycle up. It's all good. You can drop me. I wanted to bring up, uh, I've sent this to uh, you, Astral, uh, via email. And I've shared on Twitter. Um, I shared the 2024 Senate Armed Services Appropriation Bill um, that was passed uh, for funding that included AFRICOM, United States African Command Unmanned Mothership Experimentations, um, and that is Gillibrand's branch. That that that's the committee that she sits on. That is the SAS uh, Senate Armed Services. They put forward that uh, that bill funding. And in that bill funding, there's a whole lot of things. It's like 660, pa 660 pages plus. Um, in that, uh, they speak specifically to United States AFRICOM Command Unmanned Mothership Experimentations. Yo, that sounds wild. Bob, do you know anything about this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, look, we fly, we fly aircraft over every theater of engagement that runs the entire theater's operations. And they typically have a lot of people on them, but we have too many places on the earth where we want to have assets and not enough people to put on those airplanes, so they're going to turn it over to artificial intelligence. They will not be armed but they will be able to coordinate and, other st and do sensory concentration, uh, 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 situational awareness development, and distribution of situational awareness to the operators in the theater. That is definitely coming. It is, it, Lockheed Martin is really into it already. It's already been appropriated. It's already been paid for. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, Lockheed Martin's been developing it for a long time. And, 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 and Gillibrand Senator, and Senator and, Gillibrand knows Gil everything. Gillibrand and Ernst, Gillibrand and Ernst uh, put, have backed that's it right. going into. They know about it. And, it. and that's why I shared this with you, Astral, so that you could, like, go back and say that, you know, I'm not just making this up. Um, go check your email. You'll see it. It's, um, it is a, an appropriations bill that has been passed by the SAS. And it speaks specifically to African Command unmanned mothership experimentations. That's the Yo. best. Th that that's the best theater in the entire globe in which to do this experimentation. Given that we are not involved heavily in an active conflict, it's the right place to do it. Yeah, thanks for that, Chair. I just followed you, by the way. So if you want to DM me it too, um, I'll check it out. Probably a quicker way to get to me. Thanks, LM. Uh, Paranormal, and then uh, over to Larry and then Paul. Yeah, I just... Um, one thing I wanted to address real quick. Uh, the author of the threat, that was uh, John Mack, right? Or do, do I have the names? Jacob. Jake, okay. Yeah, David, David okay, Jacobs. Yeah. Um, David Jacobs. David Jacobs. Okay, I, I, get the, I get the names very confused, but... One thing I do agree with him on is that the Greys, the Greys in particular, have like increased their hybrid activities on this planet a lot in the last like century, and I think now his his thesis on that is that they just arrived here and they just found us recently, which of course is ridiculous. But um, he, where, where he's partially right is they have increased their, their hybrid breeding activities here on Earth, but only because their hybrids have weaker immune systems than the average person. And if you try to integrate hybrids in the 19th century, the 18th century, any time before plumbing, any time before, you know, 
uh, antibiotics, the rate of death among your hybrids would have been just huge. And when you talk about just getting things at an intuitive level or having you know, spiritual experiences, I actually had one recently where I got this really strong, like, psychic download out of the blue as to why, since I was a little kid, since I was a baby, basically, I was, I had so many near-death experiences with just minor illnesses. Like, I'm, I'm a very weak immune system. And as an adult, I still have a weak immune, an incredibly weak immune system. I, I worked full time as a, as a security guard, full supervisor, and I get sick nowadays with the way illnesses are going. I get sick every two months. I got to work now, of course. I can't really take off. And two weeks ago, I was the sickest I've ever been in my life. Like, my fever was off the charts. But, uh, you know, enough, of, enough of, of my complaining. But basically, the, do- the sort of psychic, intuitive download I got was my immune system. And I've been told in my labs and inductions that you've got reptilian in you and, and gray in you from different, different bloodlines and intermixing. But, but my, my immune system is gray dominant. Like, basically, my, my white blood cells are basically just... They're so great. The way, the way, you know, the whole Pachinko game genetic, you know, shook out, I ended up with an, like, a, an immune system that's like too great. And that's why I've got a weak ass immune system, essentially, and barely survive something. But now, like I said, if I'd been born in the 19th century, the 18th century, if I'd been born in a country without plumbing, I would be dead a long time ago. You know, and I use all sorts of homeopathic, you know, I want a guy like take vitamin C, drink water, I don't drink alcohol. But the point is, the reason the grays have increased their hybrid program substantially in the last you know, hundred years or so is just because their hybrids could not, and I, I don't just mean 50-50 hybrids, I mean 20% of you know, the types that blend in. Like when I, during a my lab, the category they told me I was, and I'm not saying this couldn't have been partially solid, but they, the category they said I was in is, the, the term was ringer. They called me a ringer. You know, like, uh, you know, you've heard that term wrestling and horse racing, and they switch out a horse at the last minute, it looks the same. And so, but basically, if you have hybrid genetics, especially if you have some great hybrid genetics, your immune system is going to be not the greatest. So that's why they're, they're sort of rushing, you know, squeezing in all these hybrids that they could have done a thousand years ago, five thousand. Reptilians were, were, you know, big time doing hybridization thousands of years ago. The greys had to wait for plumbing and then for antibiotics. Or their, their hybrids would have just been knocked down like bony pits. So that's just my, you know, just throwing it out there. Thank you, man. Appreciate it, dude. May I ask real question, uh, a real quick question? How... how- what is your... Part. What is your basis for making these assertions? Well, as as far as the weakness of the gray immune system, my own abductions, like what what what, what part? Yeah, the the thing that goes beyond your personal experience. I mean, you're making some generalizations, and I mean, I've heard those stories too. But my question is, how do we know that any of those suppositions about you know? The grays, you know, deteriorating DNA and need for, um, you know, human DNA assistance to support, et cetera, that whole broad trope of, of argumentation. How do we know that's true? Well, a lot of people involved in the gray hybrid program, a lot of them like these, have been told that specifically, you know, one of the reasons they, they do need, they're trying to buy human DNA is they have a number of genetic problems. Now, I wouldn't say the grays are dying, necessarily, but they do have... They've basically been civilized too long, and I think part of that is because they're from an insectoid-type heritage of kind of naturally being perfectionistic, and after a certain, you know, number of about millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years... I mean, we know that, for example, Zero Reticuli. I mean, we know that the, the, the sun there is, like, what, a million years older than the sun? It's some, it's some ridiculous, it's a much older stuff. So you basically have a society that's much older, and they came from an insect-type heritage, which means they were probably civilized. What, you know, they might have never even had, like, a caveman phase. They might have just, like, you know, ants, bees, wild, you know, they're very civil. They're, they're, too, they're too civilized, essentially. And they get to the point that if you're too civilized for too long and too clean, even if 
you genetically robust, your immune system is going to get weak because your society has just worked too well for too long. You have no reason to have an immune system. And it kind of, you know... Um, I'll grant, so I, I think I'll grant that, that all that's possible, right. and I'll grant that the, uh, the age of their son is, is much older. But how do we know what you're asserting has any basis in fact other than just general lore that's out there that we assume is true? Well, I just, my own experience is having this ridiculously weak immune system and also having, you know, my labs and abductions. And like I said earlier, I had the color blindness cure in the abduction a few years ago, which is, which is insane because that's like biologically impossible. So I, I know these aren't just really extensive hallucinations. I've, I've had other physical evidence too. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, just span the space here, but as far as what they've told many abductees and not just me, yes, they have, for example, the grays, they can reproduce on their own, but they have like a huge uh, miscarriage rate. They have like a 30, 40% miscarriage rate. So I think when people are saying the grays are dying and they can't reproduce, that's an exaggeration, but it's, it's sort it's, it's mostly true. They are physically, they've got all sorts of problems, and mixing with humans kind of helps a lot of those problems. Well, and, and, again, and I, I would simply ask, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm really not. Well, we can He's, move on. Like, we, don't, we don't need to dig into his individual uh, like experience in terms of the entire phenomenon. I think it could be taken for each person. Um, you know, we don't have to... I'm not questioning his personal experience. No, I'm just trying to explain why. You're talking about the overall perception of of the non-human intelligence and their intentions and the beings and all of that. I think that can tie back to data. And I always look at multiple of individual experiences and um, taking that into account and less about somebody's individual experience and their opinions on what's going on. I, think I, agree, I agree with so, general. Something has caused something has caused the gray hybrid program to accelerate a lot faster than the other hybrid, like the reptilian hybrid programs. Other. Something has caused in the last century that program to really accelerate more than the other programs. And I'm just offering an explanation that it or at least my best view on it, and that is it's because their hybrids needed plumbing, they needed antibiotics, they, they couldn't they, they couldn't survive the level of illness from the nineteenth century, the eighteenth century. They had to wait for a certain level of civilization to even get their hybrids into our society, or they would have been just completely burned off. All that's so that's why all that stuff you know. may be true, and I'm not meaning to be the dead horse being ass here. I'm just trying to figure out okay. why we can trust that that assessment of the situation is an accurate one we can't trust it and that's the point i think we're we are beating a dead horse here i do want to go on to the hands um no disrespect to anybody but i i do feel like this is kind of running around in a little bit of a circle so respectfully we've got a bunch of hands up i'm kind of fucking tired (laughs) so uh this has been a fantastic space but i do want to kind of wrap it up here um, if everybody could kind of make their last points, um, I'm going to close the space up in about 15 minutes. Um, I do appreciate everybody. This has been a phenomenal discussion, um, but I do want to kind of wrap it up here for everybody. And uh, thanks.